Greetings, this is Greg. Today's talk is class number two from J.B. Stroibel. We're addressing three topics today. One is why ICE manufacturers are at a competitive disadvantage to Tesla. Number one. Number two, his contention that uh, to not control fuel is a shortcoming of ICE manufacturers. And three, the fact that Tesla is forcing uh, a number of manufacturers back into vertical inter integration, which will then make them more competitive with Tesla. Greetings, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. The Gates for Stakes Nokia Mall Spybine in German. Srazvice Nihao Ma, Russian and Chinese. Um, I apologize for those who hate the language stuff. As I've discussed previously, we have viewers from around the world, and most of my talk is in English, so I'm actually making some effort to include. Uh, some of the other languages that represent viewership that we get on our channel. Um, this talk is a continuation, and my plan is once a week to do a talk focused on J.B. Stroibel. As I shared with you, um, one of his uh, former students is a mentee of mine and gave me class notes for him. So this is the last of sessions that I'm doing relative to uh, talks that he's given in, in the recent past, and we'll start moving heavily into the class materials that he taught from. In today's talk, the first item, as I shared, that I'd like to cover is JB actually suggested that in the case of the ice manufacturers uh, or internal combustion engine manufacturers globally, he thought that um, one, one element of a competitive disadvantage was the fact that uh, Tesla is operates somewhat as a software company. So one of the things he covered is the fact that if you look at the internal controls of the vehicles, Tesla has actually chosen to move to touch screens, etc., because it gives you the freedom over time to do upgrades or changes in the software and not be limited by what a knob or button might be able to do. So it's kind of like the difference between, let's say, an iPhone screen versus working with a screen, uh, versus working with a Blackberry. You have all those keys, and they limit uh, the fluidity and changes and so forth that you can make. Uh, a second element of this relative to software that he pointed out that he felt was a disadvantage to the ICE companies was management when the core of your company is actually software folks rather than uh, long time sort of engineering folks in the car space. Um, he felt that this was an advantage because the um, it was a huge advantage because he gave an example of one of their clients that's based in Europe had asked them for a solution on a product they delivered. The executive asked the question, well, what happens if the software has a malfunction? The uh, response given by uh, him was that there are ways in the software to address sort of malfunctions of the software, so it's not a big deal. So the customer in this case requested that they put in a, bra a metal bracket to address uh, unexpected behavior by the software, and what he explained was, you know, this is kind of an example of the fact that as you look at the top reaches of all the major, you know, internal combustion engine manufacturers, most of the folks sort of grew up in the business on the hardware or, or you know, engine side or, or sales side or wherever it may be, but their orientation is typically not towards 
you know, where Tesla's at, which is kind of a software company with an over overlay of cars. The second suggestion he made that I thought was rather interesting was he suggested that he couldn't figure out why it is that none of the major manufacturers of automobiles in the world have their own gas stations. And so I was kind of shocked by this because, as you know, Tesla has a large charging station for superchargers and expanding. And so in the electric space, this probably makes sense, particularly if you have a certain sort of nature of how your batteries work with those chargers. I think there's no choice but to build out your network. But the suggestion was that why is it that anyone in the auto business might consider putting a gas station in? And so this sounded kind of fishy to me, and I really thought about it. And I actually have to admit that I had an encounter at the headquarters of BMW in Montvale, New Jersey, and this is about 20 years ago. So I had a test vehicle that I had been driving for about a week. And what I like to do whenever I visit a manufacturer, and I encourage you guys to do this as well, is if you drive around in the parking lot behind those buildings, uh, there's some really interesting vehicles there. Number one, the executives and engineers will do things to their car that are really cool, and you can get tips on things to consider adding or changing on your car based on the fact that they have unlimited budgets and they have access to sort of company materials you don't. The second thing that happens is that as you're roaming around back there, you're going to run into some really sharp engineers who love automobiles and um, are working on their cars. So my encounter in BMW was interesting because I pulled up behind, I believe it was a 3 Series, but it may be a higher level car. And I was parking the car, I was returning it to BMW, and as I got out of it, there was a BMW that was running in front of me, and I kind of listened to the engine, and the, the car um, was sort of wheezing and coughing almost as it was running. So the engineer opened the trunk and dug his hand in and pulled out a couple of bottles of Tecrolene. He then injected those into the fuel tank, and all of a sudden, a car that was wheezing and coughing all of a sudden calmed down and just had a very clean, smooth sound. And all of this took a grand total of 30 seconds for it to hit the, in, you know, hit the consumption of the engine and make a difference. So I was sort of intrigued by that because as I was thinking about JB's comments, it really came to mind that if you, let's say with GM or BMW or Mercedes or any of these, um, they have to build their cars to specs that allow them to work with whoever's fuel they're going to be using. But if they own some of their own gas stations, people who own the, particularly the high-end version of those cars, that uh, there might be cause for them to choose to go to a Mercedes fuel tank. And if they did so, Mercedes could start doing or making changes to the engine configuration relative to additives that they might put in fuel that spec for their cars. So on the surface, it sounded like he was crazy, but as I thought about it, it kind of makes sense. And hence, Mr. GM, Mr. Mercedes, Mr. BMW, how about a few gas stations, even Mr. Audi, how about some gas stations that are optimized to your engines? I think your customers would appreciate it. And initially I thought it was a dumb idea, but now that I'm thinking about it, I think it's a great idea. The final area that I'd like to uh, consider is the whole vertical integration question. So when Tesla first came out, what they noticed was if they wanted to compete with other manufacturers, they could easily walk into the marketplace and buy you know, off-the-shelf parts from suppliers to these manufacturers and build whatever they wanted. As they got into heavy production out of the, the initial three to 5,000 roadsters, where they did much of that, they started uh, optimizing for what the needs of, the, of an electric vehicle might be, particularly the Model S is where they did it the most. But basically, uh, Tesla has been aggressively reversing the 100-year tradition of not making parts. So basically, one of the 
one of the good things about having your own parts apparatus that makes your parts, Tesla's 80% vertically integrated, is that you can get specs that you really want. Um, you can also control competitors because they can't buy the parts for, for their vehicle that you produce. So for example, the battery would be a great example, but there are other things that they do that can't be replicated by others easily because they don't have uh, access to the supplier of that, which is Tesla. The third issue that pops up is if you vertically integrate, it means that you end up having to keep more capital on hand uh, in the form of finished goods of whatever you're producing. So it's not as efficient in terms of how fast or how, how fast you turn money over. So this is one of the, the rubs that's been on Tesla for a while is that they consume a lot of cash and have a lot of cash sitting within the company and continue to raise more cash. And it's been deemed a negative, but uh, what's starting to happen, for example, Mercedes has decided that they're going to build their own first small battery factory, but the problem is there's a huge demand for the batteries and there's limited supply of it because the whole industry is just growing into meet, growing towards meeting the demand globally for lithium ion batteries or and battery packs. So I just find it interesting that Tesla is one of the smallest in terms of numbers of vehicles manufactured in the world currently. But the manner in which they're winning is forcing all the other major firms that are way bigger and way more valuable <coughs> to re-engineer or rethink um, their process. Because I think that if you're going to compete with Tesla and others like them, I think you're going to need to have your own batteries so that you can optimize the setup of battery to engine uh, going forward. And if you don't have that, you're kind of stuck along with you know, five or ten other manufacturers in line in Korea trying to get batteries where everyone has the same cost basis. And when the battery represents greater than 50% of the, the cost uh, associated with the company, I guess the battery and the engine, you know, you could call it that, it gives whoever has those two an advantage over others because there's such a large integral portion of the manufacturing process that's controlled by an outside entity. So, you know, to close out, these are three examples that are both obvious and not so obvious that JB raises about the Tesla competitive advantage against other manufacturers, particularly ICE manufacturers. And it's crazy, but they're forcing some very big names to rethink how they are structured uh, as we enter the world of electric vehicles in large scale. Um, <coughs> I'm still kind of stunned right now because I just had a discussion argument with a friend of mine about the status of, uh, you know, both Volvo and um, Jaguar have announced that they're going to go fully electric in two years. And it sounds great, kind of makes sense, but I'm still wondering, given the shortage of batteries, how exactly they're going to pull that off. So. I'm, I'm assuming they're going to build some huge factories in Japan, in China to address this based on who their owners are, but um, I think they're going to have to delay this mission, their plan for multiple years uh, until they can get supply, you know, of batteries to execute this. Uh, hence, I think it just shows more of Tesla's competitive advantage. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks for taking time out to view. Look forward to your comments. Tschüss, mach's gut, au revoir, à tout à l'heure, la hitra haute. Please like and subscribe.